everyone for joining. Welcome to T-Space Architecture Lecture Series. This is the second lecture in a series of eight organized by T-Space within the framework of the Architecture Residency Program. I am Irini Tsakhreli. I'm a practicing architect and educator in New York, currently instructing and directing the Architecture Residency Program for T-Space. With me is Maxwell Funk, he is our co-host for this event, also an architect and the residency administrator. Hello, Max. And our residents are joining us on the panel from all parts of the world. Uh, hello, Reggie Mays, Megan Pisarchik, Alexander Kern, Brian Hartman, Jack Watthew, and Yolanda Wen. Welcome, everyone. Our residents are young professionals and students in the field of art and architecture with special inclinations to music and philosophy. They've all gathered to experiment with design and push critical thinking forward. The residency program, for those of you who don't know, is a 25-day intensive. It started just this Monday and it takes place once a year, every July. The general umbrella theme for this year's residency is transformation of consciousness, continuation of our theme from last year. And I do want to take a brief moment to thank especially Steve Pulimont, Silman Engineers, the IHEIT Foundation and the Art of Building in Rhinebeck because they have offered scholarships to each one of our residents this year. We're very, very pleased and thankful for their general support. And we certainly welcome your support as well to make more scholarships available in the future and make this program accessible to everybody. Um, you may see in the chat uh, relevant links if you like to make a contribution. And for those of you who don't know, T-Space is a nonprofit organization. It's an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation. It focuses on arts, education, design, and ecology. And in addition to the architecture residency program that I just introduced, it offers uh, events that focus on the synthesis of the arts, architecture, art, music, and poetry coming together. One such event is coming up already next Saturday on July 17th. It's called Raptures and Reconciliations by architect and artist Anthony Titus with music by Anthony Braxton and poetry by Kathy Park Hong. We're really pleased for to have this combination of artists in T-Space and uh, the links for you to register are also in the chat. Note all these events are taking place virtually this summer and we're certainly looking forward to welcome you in person next year in the summer. Now, I'd like to welcome our main guest speaker for today, Ivan Bahn, who is joining us live from Amsterdam. Hello, Ivan. Hello. It's a great pleasure <laughs> to have you. Ivan Bahn uh, is a photographer, of course, very well-known photographer, Dutch. Uh, his work focuses on images that show how individuals, communities, and societies create and interact with their built environment. He is the inaugural recipient of the Julius Schulman Award for photography and has photographed, of course, Stephen Hall's work extensively, but has also collaborated with many prominent architects globally. His work has won numerous awards, including the Golden Lion for best installation at the 2012 Venice Architecture Biennial. It's really a great pleasure to have you, Ivan, and I'll pass it on to you now. For our audience, so it, it, briefly, the structure is approximately 35 to 40 minutes um, uh, presentation by Ivan, followed by 15 minutes, approximately Q&A initiated by our panel, but also taking questions from the broader audience. So please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A area um, now, or as soon as we start, don't wait until the end. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it on to Ivan. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction and very nice to be here. Welcome everyone. Um, I thought I'll show um, a little bit an introduction on uh, my work and the way I try to look at the built environment. And I wanted to talk about two books. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, let me see. 
Um, so yeah, you know my work probably a lot from the architecture and design pages of different uh, magazines and publications and so, um, but I want to show you also a little bit, um, yeah, what, what I'm try how I'm trying to portray architecture and the built environment, uh, places, people, and uh, my own interest uh, uh, surrounding these. Um, a big part of my work is always these aerial uh, views of cities and places like a field. It gives an incredible kind of understanding of how a city grew over time, um, the sort of topography of a place. Um, and then uh, in the end, also like how architecture becomes part of that and uh, like takes place of it, how the city around it sort of responds to that, how architecture uh, yeah, responds to the city and so. And these are, of course, a couple of views of New York, which I did on different uh, trips uh, to the city. Um, uh, for instance, here, Stevens Library, the Queen's Library, and like these views where you get a kind of elevated view, um, show it in the context, suddenly you can really show the relations between different landmarks, different uh, points which people start to recognize and it gives a kind of incredible understanding of yeah uh, a place uh, a location of a place and like why a building is in a certain place and not somewhere else and the uh, those are the kind of stories i'm trying to tell through my photographs for instance here herning uh, in uh, denmark the museum stephen did and um, also like, yeah, when you, uh, of course, the design is really exceptional, but when, once you start to understand sort of that whole landscape where it's in uh, this sort of perfect uh, Danish context where everything seems to be perfectly laid out and made for a specific place that really sort of puts uh, the puzzle pieces in place in a way. And it's th that it's also not just sort of the, um, uh, the architecture itself, but that it speaks to the city. And uh, uh, here the Campbell Sports Center, for instance, which suddenly yeah, gives that relation with, with New York City, although it's all the way uptown. Um, yeah, I happen to fly over there just around sunset where the sports field sort of, uh, the lights of the sports field uh, illuminate the players there, but also illuminates the building and suddenly really gives it a sense of space and a sense of place. And um, here we're in uh, Doha, Qatar, uh, where I've been on numerous occasions for uh, different uh, projects of the uh, Qatar Museums and the uh, Education uh, Department of Qatar. Here you see kind of the peninsula um, uh, and uh, the new uh, Jean Nouvel building, the um, museum, the Qatar Museum. Uh, and yeah, to kind of take the distance of the architecture, show that context, sort of this endless uh, city, the same kind of, um, yeah, uh, almost sand patina from the desert there, what takes over the city and how, yeah, uh, this new building becomes part of that. Um, I find that always really fascinating to look at it uh, from that way. And going here through a couple of cities uh, for different projects. This was for instance, for Toyo Ito, when I was in Tokyo, he asked me to uh, photograph his new theater, the Suginami theater. And when I first uh, encountered that space, like I was really struck by the uh, strange juxtaposition between the building and the rest of Tokyo. Like Tokyo for me feels always as this very light, um, white city, like uh, lots of the buildings have this sort of uh, white kind of patina because of the building materials, uh, the incredible kind of pixelation of the city, each plot which is divided into smaller plots and so on. Um, and then you see uh, his theater, this massive black uh, box, uh, super fluid and almost kind of tent like structure. So yeah, again, when you sort of step away from uh, the focus on the architecture, you see the juxtaposition, position and you really see, yeah, uh, how that uh, came together there in, in Tokyo. Um, a few other examples here, uh, Dubai, 
with the tallest tower, a strange spire in the middle of this road uh, with all the high rises and for the rest basically desert and low rises uh, around it. Uh, Michael Maltzen's uh, inner city arts building in um, the warehouse district of LA where like everything is this sort of kind of the opposite as Tokyo, the black uh, 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 kind of a uh, big uh, undefined warehouses where uh, Michael did this uh, uh, beautiful uh, detailed sharp uh, uh, small intervention of this small uh, art school in the middle of it and Los Angeles with the sort of incredible flatness the highways and how uh, that sort of that infrastructure puts it all together and especially at night when like these roads are lit by the cars by the traffic lights the street lights and give this other kind of um yeah grid to uh, to Los Angeles the infrastructure the oil which is still such a part of Los Angeles which like from uh, most uh, roads you cannot really see but with this kind of elevated view you suddenly see the close proximity of these places to the uh, the city itself um let me cycle quickly through this oh yeah, or for instance this uh, uh, shot of Miami um, and we know, of course, yeah, the uh, big challenges Miami has with rising sea levels, uh, the water, uh, which is like literally the land, which is literally inches above the water, uh, all the new high rises who are coming up. But especially when you step away uh, from there and see it from high up and like here, I'm really high up. You see in the uh, bottom right here, like an airplane flying underneath me, but that suddenly gives uh, that context and you literally see that land kind of sitting like literally inches above the water and the fragility of a place like that. Um, and then of course many of these places in the global south um, uh, here are the outskirts of Mexico City um, uh, with the sort of endless uh, informal uh, city there but then also like a place here like Kyoto in a way which is not so different um, uh, uh, looking from above you see also like the incredible pixelation uh, how these all these plots became smaller and smaller over time uh, but then also the big imperial gardens and the uh, royal palaces which still occupy these large uh, super blocks in the city or like Tokyo with its uh, how organically that basically grew along the waterways waterways which eventually became um, highways and other infrastructural means in the city and like a whole city which is uh, uh, seems to be completely fluid around that and then when you, for instance, look here at Kenya, Nairobi, in the outskirts of Nairobi, where you have this uh, massive slum, one of the largest slums of, uh, of Africa, where they estimate uh, about a million people live. And from above, like, it's not such a far stretch to see, like, how a place like that would eventually evolve, yeah, to, uh, to a, a more modern city, hopefully. But like when you see that from above, like this sort of continuous roof of corrugated steel with small alleys and like how that completely grew uh, organically over time. Or a place here like Caracas um, with the hills, uh, the mountains with like which are completely filled with the informal housing. This was one of the images I took uh, for the book and exhibition on the Torre de Vite, the informal uh, cities uh, in Caracas and this tower, uh, uh, an unfinished uh, a construction tower which people invaded and built basically a kind of virtual, uh, uh, a vertical city uh, in it. Um, and yeah, these ways how people sort of occupy places and uh, uh, take over places sometimes in totally unexpected ways are always uh, fascinating for me to see. Um, this was a place I stumbled upon in uh, Manila in the Philippines. And I was there and I 
uh, got a tour from one of the professors at the architecture school and he told me like uh, one of the places he took his students always to was this cemetery in the north of Manila because he said basically this cemetery shows basically the whole architecture history just on that cemetery like you see kind of all the stages of architecture from like the Egyptians to the Romans to like all the different styles um, basically in miniature um, as these kind of mausoleums which were built all over the um, uh, the cemetery and like of course all these styles and um, uh, building methods got uh, used there for these different mausoleums but then there was another uh, uh, problem there in the city of course a city which is rapidly expanding people trying to occupy kind of any found space uh, for informal cities and so on but this large cemetery where yeah people have been buried in these mausoleums for uh, like centuries basically um like each mausoleum also had its uh caretaker or caretakers and over time these caretakers slowly started to move into these mausoleums so they took care of the graves uh, helped the families uh, taking care of the graves but at the same time like these families grew uh, they kind of invaded these places and right now this cemetery is also the home of 30,000 people who basically live inside the cemetery and it's basically a complete city in there so people have little shops, they work there, they cook there, uh, study there, and it be became kind of a city as uh, any other city, except that you literally live between the, the graves um, and these mausoleums. And like here you see a little shop within the back, uh, there's the, um, uh, uh, the graves. And for them, like it became, yeah, uh, uh, literally really a kind of background and uh, most of the time of the year they hardly uh, see that uh, um, uh, that background anymore and it they live as it in it as in any other city and only during the day of the dead uh, when the families of the deceased uh, come back they sort of clean up everything clean out everything and it becomes a regular graveyard again but most of the time of the year it's it's um, a city as any other city almost where everyone sort of goes on with their life and um, lives and works a place and so on um, this is a series uh, I did a few years ago for a book I worked on with Manuel Hertz, architect from uh, Switzerland. It's called African Modernism. Um, and we focused on five countries in Africa who were all in a very specific moment in time, in the 60s, 70s, and um, when they were just becoming independent. Um, uh, uh, and as part of their independence and a very specific moment in time, of course, it was the time like that uh, these big building projects like Brasilia and Chandigarh just happened. And as a kind of nation building, these countries also started yeah, building their own uh, universities, um, government buildings, uh, uh, large housing projects and so on everywhere on the continent. So we focused on five countries, Ghana, Senegal, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Kenya, and Zambia. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking at how these places, um, yeah, uh, yeah, we're in a very, this very specific moment in time, often hired architects from their former colonizing countries, basically, who knew in a way the context well, but at the same time, like, yeah, there was a, wide open space they could basically design and um, really uh, incorporate all kind of new ideas uh, to these places. Right here we're in uh, an Ivory Coast, Yamasukro, which basically became the kind of new government capital in the center of the country. You see here the uh, house of the president with a big uh, canal with its sort of natural predators uh, in the canal. Um, uh, but so that became this new sort of government capital for Ivory Coast. But also like the Vatican uh, built this um, 
the church built this uh, gigantic copy uh, in a uh, scale actually uh, a half a time larger than the original Vatican. They built basically a complete copy of the Vatican there in, uh, um, in Yamasukro at that time. But then also like these beautiful examples of universities there um, and how these places are still yeah, completely in use, occupied, taken over, uh, sometimes also in completely different ways. Uh, for instance, this is a housing complex in Dakar, in the capital of uh, Senegal. And in the outskirts of Senegal is this beautiful uh, exhibition center by French architect and um, yeah, this uh, idea of these triangles which sort of went uh, all the way through to all the, the details um, and yeah it's this big uh, exhibition complex but also like kind of half invaded by people uh, uh, taken over the place uh, sometimes it becomes storage sometimes it becomes other things uh, but at the same time like still a completely functioning place uh, after all these years and for instance, here we're in uh, uh, Zambia, uh, Lusaka, the capital. And there was this one sort of major road in the center of the uh, capital where all the sort of uh, large government uh, offices were, the central bank, uh, many of the ministries and so on, um, where uh, these architects in the uh, 60s and 70s could really do extraordinary things. And um, at the same time, also like with very little means and uh, trying to use, yeah, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, yeah, it was not based on um, many technological advancements at the time, like uh, usually no air conditioning um, and all the electricity is pretty limited still in those places. So also using yeah, all kinds of uh, ways of uh, shading, uh, natural ventilation in these places and, um, uh, yeah, really sturdy uh, uh, buildings, but still really beautiful environments where these people live in and which can survive these kind of places also for a long time to go, I feel like. Even they, though like often they're not very well taken care of, like uh, these the bones of these kind of places are so strong that um, uh, it's really nice how these places are kind of taken over. This is, for instance, the parliament building uh, in Lusaka. And here we're in Kenya, in Nairobi, the capital again, where like in the center of the city is this bus terminal with this sort of continuous swirl of uh, buses coming in and out um, against that kind of uh, a really colorful patina of the, of the city in the background. And there's this tower, the Kenyatta Tower. Um, uh, at the time, uh, it was the tallest tower in on the African continent, which was built in offices and government building, um, where in this uh, circular, triangular uh, building next to it um, is the seat of the government in this beautiful wood paneled um, uh, uh, circular space. And you see like often very uh, simple uh, materials, uh, big concrete slabs to uh, create shaded uh, environments, the stark contrast with the ex outside and the inside. And from kind of double um, uh, facades to uh, filter the sunlight in. Or uh, this beautiful market uh, also in Kenya in the capital a very simple idea of these big canopies, these big kind of concrete umbrellas where all life and markets and people and so happens underneath. Uh, these people who are sort of really uh, enclosed and part of almost of the, of the market, um, but it's shaded from the sun, from the rain and uh, something very uh, simple and basic, which can, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, work for a long time to come. Um, I wanted to show here another project I worked on 
uh, with Tatiana Bilbao, um, architect from Mexico. And it's a project we started about uh, three years, two and a half years, three years ago. Um, and it started out of an, um, a studio Tatiana gave uh, at Yale University, um, where she was interested in the whole connection uh, between Mexico and the United States. Um, she started this collaboration with 13 different un uh, universities from all over the United States and Mexico, uh, uh, universities in America who studied specific places in Mexico where you saw the American influence in Mexico, uh, Mexican universities which studied uh, a couple of specific places in the US um, or along the border. Uh, where you saw the Mexican influence uh, in America and sort of trying to give a large overview of these uh, uh, two uh, uh, countries and at the same time like to see how interwoven these countries are. So I want to give uh, show a couple of uh, these different places and um, it's not so much immediately architecture but really shows these landscapes, uh, the people and how uh, yeah, uh, despite all the rhetoric uh, of these two different countries, uh, at the same time, like these places are so interwoven and so uh, connected with each other. And we start here in Cincinnati or the place or around Cincinnati, uh, which was largely a rural community, lots of farming and so, but which made a big transformation uh, in the 90s with the NAFTA agreements. Uh, which really influenced like yeah how people uh, like the food distribution and so on and and this whole rural uh, a kind of natural agricultural landscape was transformed into a huge kind of shipping hub because basically in a two day uh, truck drive uh, around Cincinnati, you could reach about 90% uh, of the US customers, which were kind of in that area uh, located. So uh, the whole suburbs uh, and cities around Cincinnati uh, had a big growth of housing to uh, yeah, um, uh, house all the workers in these uh, giant distribution centers. And so that uh, whole agricultural landscape uh, changed over the last 20, 30 years into like an agricultural uh, landscape, but in between these uh, massive uh, distribution centers, uh, trucks driving in and out everywhere. And yeah, a whole uh, kind of uh, changed landscape there. Um, another place they uh, did research on are these two cities, McAllen and Brownsville. Like they're on the uh, border between Mexico and the US, but really on the east side. Here we're on the American side. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, Brownsville and uh, looking uh, at uh, Mexico and like all these border towns, of course, you see the the connection with uh, with Mexico. Like uh, here, we're still in the U.S., but like the places are called uh, Amigo Land, uh, a convention center, the border which kind of runs straight through these communities. And yeah, how that line of the border uh, is also, of course, such a kind of arbitrary line. Um, which literally runs through backyards of houses uh, and fields and so on. Often kind of divided by the Rio Grande. This is a small border patrol, duty free um, uh, center right on the Rio Grande. And here we're on the Mexico side uh, with the bridge connecting to the US. And on the Mexican side, uh, there's giant like recycling facilities, uh, garbage uh, facilities and so on. And um, uh, that particular place, yeah, uh, a very uh, stark uh, contrast from the American uh, side. Here we're going to Puebla in Mexico. Um, and it's an interesting place. Uh, um, uh, one of the universities uh, defined um, yeah, where most of the remittance money from 
uh, the US went back to Mexico. And when you start tracing that see where Mexicans who work in the US, they send often part of their income back to uh, Mexico. And when you start tracing that money, these where the, most of that money goes to and look at that landscape there, um, you see a, a rapidly changing landscape where people who are in the US uh, start buying properties uh, for their families um, and ask their families basically to uh, build their kind of dream home for eventually when they start to come back to Mexico, a place where they could live and um, uh, maybe retire or so. And so um, all these villages in, these, uh, in the countryside there, like you see a lot of building activity uh, uh, construction shops and so on, but also like everywhere, these buildings which are hardly ever finished and uh, at the same time are all these kind of fantastical houses um, based often on ideas like uh, uh, the workers who uh, came from Mexico, live in the US, uh, start to think how, how their a kind of future home in uh, Mexico should look like. Um, so yeah, the kind of references with America you see everywhere, like um, uh, the money exchanges, the, the Western Union sort of transfer uh, stations. And then, yeah, everywhere these plots with uh, these fantastical homes, which are kind of forever uh, under construction often. Um, for instance, this street with like every house uh, painted in a very distinctive, different color. Um, or influenced by all kind of different cultural uh, influences. And so everywhere in the Mexican countryside, you see like these areas uh, starting to come up. And often people, yeah, whenever they have some money, they send it back and uh, a family there in Mexico starts building these places, uh, sometimes inhabiting also the construction sites and slowly over the years, uh, uh, yeah, building up these places. But of course, it's also kind of a very unregulated uh, building um industry there and uh, unfortunately many of these things are very poorly built and it's uh, also an uh, earthquake prone uh, area where uh, quickly things get uh, destroyed also it's a very difficult place um Another university did this research more on Mexico City, how that's built on, on literally the lakes, um, uh, different parts of uh, Mexico City, the uh, big juxtapositions between um, uh, different societies and uh, the rich and the poor, these um, uh, informal cities, like uh, which rides around like the high rises with um, uh, uh, a very different uh, uh. and when you go to the outskirts uh, of Mexico City where you really see how yeah how it's still built basically on these lakes how the lakes are uh, sometimes dent in or dredged and uh, yeah the large informal cities uh, surrounding it um, here, this is one, like there's this dike uh, um, uh, keeping the water out and then this large informal uh, community right next to it. Um, another university who did this research on these two sister cities, uh, Austin uh, and Monterey. Uh, Austin here in the US, two cities which uh, like experience a rapid growth at the moment. Um, uh, 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 downtown and uh, centers which uh, uh, are developing really fast. Um, we're here in Austin, like uh, also both these kind of river cities in Austin, like it's a very recreational uh, part around the river, uh, which has yeah been really 
a change to get with river parks, uh, swimming, uh, and so on. Downtown, where all the high rises, all the glass uh, boxes are coming up. But then in the outskirts of Austin, where you see the whole Mexican uh, communities uh, who are living there and uh, building their uh, home base. And where you see kind of all the references still to the Mexican communities and everything from the cemeteries to uh, housing and so on. And then here we're in Monterey, uh, it lays in this spe spectacular valley um, with uh, tall uh, mountains on both sides, but also like a river going straight through it. But the river is butted on both sides only by highways and is hardly accessible. And um, uh, yeah, very different kind of community. And then in the outskirts, you have these massive social housing communities which are popping up, which are all built by the Mexican government. Uh, these uh, like literally kind of copy paste, generic uh, boxes, very little green in between, um, which is uh, part of this uh, massive social housing uh, uh, effort the Mexican government is making. Here we're going to Ulysses, Kansas, uh, which is also a very particular place. Uh, the moment you step basically out of the airplane there, you step into this uh, strong stench of a cow manure, basically. It's a, a very rural agricultural um, uh, environment, um, partly of like farming, but also like these large, um, massive uh, cow feeding lots. So um, it's basically where yeah uh, all the dairy comes from all the uh, the uh, the meat and so so in between all the farming and so you have these massive uh, feeding lots uh, where hundreds of thousands of cows are uh, grown for uh, dairy and for for meat. So. This environment, like it's not a very pleasant place to live. Like this stench of cow manure is basically everywhere there uh, surrounding you. And it's a place where, yeah, uh, the uh, American uh, uh, demographics basically uh, shrunk over the last decennia and is largely taken over by a Hispanic uh, 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 population and you see that everywhere like the, the people who work in these places um, uh, the villages and the cities uh, around it where which have many references to uh, the Mexican culture um, uh, the uh, the mobile homes and the kind of more uh, uh, slightly informal places and then the strange juxtaposition with a, uh, a big uh, Mormon population um, who, uh, yeah, uh, uh, still manages these uh, large uh, uh, farm uh, 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 places. Um, here we're going to back to Mexico to Hidalgo, Hidalgo, another one of these um, uh, uh, remittance uh, uh, places where it's all these remittance houses um, shops, which sell all kinds of building materials in all kinds of different um, uh, uh, ways. And uh, then all the houses which come right next to that up in the most fantastical ways, basically. And they even have this giant um, uh, church, which, which was also all built uh, by remittance money, uh, money which came back from the US, from uh, Mexicans who were working in America. And it's this big concrete sarcophagus almost um, with the windows, which look like stained glass, but are kind of uh, just, um, uh, yeah, it's stained glass in front of a, um, a, a, a light, a lamp to light them up, but otherwise a completely enclosed concrete shell, basically. And then all these kind of amazing houses, which uh, are popping up there everywhere in the countryside. This kind of complete Disney castle, which has been probably under construction for maybe 20 years and uh, uh, still there. Or these two cities, El Paso and Juarez, uh, right on the border, kind of in the central part of the border. Uh, very connected um, uh, over many years. Um, but like 
here we're in uh, um, Juarez on the Mexican side, uh, largely informal city. And uh, most of these people were working over the years, like on the American side in El Paso, where there were these big uh, uh, copper smelteries, um, which were placed there because, um, uh, yeah, it was uh, a convenient place to get uh, cheap labor from Mexico in, but also like they were able to basically ramp up their production with 200% once the wind was blowing south. So most of the pollutants uh, from these large factories came down in, uh, uh, in Juarez. Um, and there's, uh, of course, horrible um yeah birth defects and health problems on the mexican side whereas the factories were largely on the american side in these places and then the border wall which runs straight through this uh, uh this whole urban area era and then uh, the rio grande uh, basically in a kind of concrete uh, shell in the middle of it dividing the two cities here you see the remains of the uh, uh, of the whole industrial part of El Paso, the copper smelteries, right on the Rio Grande. They're not working really anymore, but um, still like the uh, the remnants of that history are visible everywhere. And then right next to that is one of the poorest zip codes of, uh, of the US. So it's mainly uh, Mexican immigrants who live there um, uh, on the American side of the border, uh, living in the, uh, working in these uh, uh, factories and so on. And everywhere kind of the mix between, yeah, still the pride of Mexico, but also uh, pride of their uh, new American homeland uh, in these places. And here we're going all the way to the west side, Tecata, uh, right on the border. Uh, we're almost at the Pacific here. Tecata, which is also like a big distribution manufacturing hub um, where uh, lots of uh, warehouses and factories are located, producing all kinds of things for uh, the American market. And then when we go even a bit further west to Tijuana, um, uh, we uh, come there almost at the Pacific, uh, the border wall, which goes uh, straight there through the desert and ends uh, into the Pacific. And here we see we're on the Mexican side of the border wall and uh, on the American side, we have here the uh, prototypes Trump built uh, for the border wall and uh, showing all the different examples of uh, what his kind of beautiful border wall could look like but especially from the air like it shows the stark contrast between kind of the emptiness of of the US and like how yeah these border towns uh, with all its trade and uh, uh, people uh, Mexicans who are working in the US and so on like how all that is concentrated on the Mexican side of the border and the density of the population on that side and Tijuana is also one of the busiest border crossings in the world. I think it's like daily about uh, half a million people who cross there um, the border, uh, part uh, shipping and distributing things um, and uh, uh, people who are working in the US uh, and so on. And Tijuana, which had a, a whole history during the prohibition where Americans could get um, uh, their alcohol and that changed now more to a kind of a, a dental or like um, a, a pharmaceutical and uh, health uh, uh, public which visits Tijuana now. So like uh, dental clinics, uh, uh, cheap uh, um, um, uh, uh, kind of medical facilities there and basically on every street corner the pharmacies where you can get all the uh, American um, uh, medication uh, with uh, big discounts uh, just over the border in Mexico and then you see the border wall kind of at the end uh, disappearing into the Pacific
and yeah, like it's it's fascinating to see these borders and how intertwined these two countries are and how dependent they are, of course, also on each other. And despite all the rhetoric of these border walls, like uh, they're so dependent on each other and in trade, in work and live. And um, uh, then at the same time, like, uh, uh, they built these mass, massive border walls and we all thought like when the Berlin Wall fell uh, 30 years ago that uh, would be kind of the end of these um, uh, uh, border fences and border walls but actually like it's it feels like it's uh, only expanding and um, uh, there's more border walls than ever everywhere in the country everywhere in the world and it's um, it was a very interesting look at the whole landscape and how uh, connected these two uh, uh, countries are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ivan. Fascinating flight through those different parts of the world uh, with all those narratives and tensions that you have presented to us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are some questions already coming in from the audience. Uh, I would like to welcome and encourage everybody to type up those questions using the Q&A function and opening up uh, the conversation with our panelists, our residents here. Uh, thank you so much, Iwan, for an incredible talk. Um, you you've traveled extensively and uh, you've been around the world, you've seen architecture old and new, and you've documented the life of architecture after its construction, how it plays out afterwards. And I was wondering if you have any reflections on what kind of architecture passes the test of time and what kind of architecture falls flat, falls short of expectations. Um, yeah. I was wondering maybe if, if you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, no, that's that's always fascinating to see, and that's why I'm also, um, yeah, always trying to push my work. Also, like looking at all the architecture and how it's been sort of taken over, like these places, like for the book on African modernism or Brasilia Chandigarh, um, and so on, like to see like how these grand ideas of architects are uh, taken over over time, how people appropriate these places and like what kind of stands the test of time. Um, and often yeah, you see that also like in a way, a simple basic grand ideas work often well, like where yeah, an architect can have a beautiful idea, but it should be able to be appropriate and adapted in many different ways over time and that uh, that can help to um, uh, yeah make make a building useful like it's hard to imagine like how the world would look in uh, 20 30 50 or 100 years and how a building which is often very purpose uh, for a specific purpose built uh, could be used at that time and if you have a kind of open mind how how it can be adapted in a different way how people can adapt it can take it over uh, and can live in vastly different ways than you would expect or plan as an architect i think that that helps a lot and uh, don't depend too much on technology and uh, things like we all think like that we can save the world with high tech and um, a sustainability uh, kind of uh, uh, technology but like all that stuff breaks quickly down and you see that especially in places like in Africa and um, with these books on African modernism um, that like in the end what what stands there is is that big concrete ID um, and often it's used in a vastly different way but uh, not much can break there and not much can go wrong uh, it's all uh, still depending on uh, the ideas of natural ventilation shading uh, and all these things and it still works fantastically and uh, people use it every day and um, uh, uh, you see these places now quickly taken over by uh, like uh, in Africa um, uh, many Chinese companies are uh, coming there 
building all the sort of new glass towers. People love it. Of course, it has a kind of idea of uh, modernization, uh, big glass office towers and so, but they're all dependent on, uh, uh, on high tech, on air conditioning, on electricity and so on, which also often breaks uh, and uh, goes bad in these places. And then there's no way to uh, fix that anymore and uh, the deterioration of these kind of places happens much faster than a sort of simple grand uh, ID which takes in consideration all kind of environmental um, aspects of a place. Thank you. Um, there seems to be a, a theme of uh, adaptation, reuse, um, like you were saying, like buildings deteriorate at different rates based on how, uh, how well they, they stand to the test of time, like what breaks, what, what uh, functions without any electricity or maintenance. And I'm curious what your, your thoughts are as, as far as the future and what architecture you're seeing going up now, maybe on less grand a scale, but you know, residential and and um, kind of like smaller commercial stuff across uh, maybe the first world um, that is uh, how that might be adapted and reused. Um, like wh where do you see your at yourself uh, taking pictures in 30 years, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's um, it's difficult to say, but like if you see like the huge needs of like the global south and uh, all these massive uh, informal communities and how they have to adapt to places and like the needs they have to uh, yeah make these places really livable, um, yeah in the end that depends on uh, big infrastructural uh, plans of sewage, electricity, clean water, and so on. And like, uh, as architects, uh, they often uh, think like they can model and plan the whole world. But if you see like the amount of people uh, we eventually have to build for, like it's it, it seems to be sheer impossible to really do that. And uh, I think it will be important also to look at, this, at those kind of places more in kind of an infrastructural sense. And like, what, what do you really have to provide them? And where can people, because often people know perfectly what they need and they're capable to build and things uh, and design things and like one of the best examples is maybe like the Torre David like a, which was a, a, a yeah a concrete shell uh, a first attempt of a construction site basically where there's now a full city living in 3,000 people who adapted to that because it was basically yeah, like everyone could start um, uh, in a place like that they have already a roof over their head and over time start to uh, build sort of their own uh, place in that um, in that uh, a concrete shell but like one step further would be of course if as an architect like you have that sort of concrete shell uh, have a, a bit of infrastructure of electricity sewage and water and then let people kind of fill in what they need because like yeah it's difficult of course uh, yeah if you look at places like that, uh, the amount of people you have to build for and you have to improve uh, a, 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 a living condition. How, how would you tackle that? May I take a question from, we have questions from the audience coming in. Um, Nicholas Rapp is asking, and, and Ivan, you may be able to see I, that on your see screen here. as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ivan. Could you talk about how you approach scale in, in, in your work that's interesting for architects uh, as well. And thinking of the relationship between the aerial photographs, which to some extent abstract the built environment versus the intimate photographs of citizens on the ground. All scales have their own affordances and limitations, what they reveal and what they obscure. So how do you approach these scales and their interaction in your work? Yeah, yeah, interesting question, yeah. Um, I, um, I showed here, a lot of aerial photographs in this lecture. Um, I felt also like uh, you see a lot of my more architectural work 
in the uh, design and architecture press uh, so much. So I didn't show much of that, but that aerial work for me is uh, yeah part of that full story which you try to tell on a place like and it's constantly kind of zooming in and zooming out like from a very personal level like i came from a background of documentary photography where you try to tell a story on people on place on how people live in a place uh, and what what happens there so kind of uh, you try to be almost uh, yeah uh, only focusing on people and how they uh, they live in a place uh, and architecture becomes their kind of a background and then slowly you start to zoom out uh, see more of the space of the place of the built environment around it how it's part of a context up to yeah these uh, fast aerials where um, the building is really only a small part of it and where you try to uh, tell more a story on how the city itself developed and I feel like especially for the books I'm working on always like that sort of zooming in and zooming out um, uh, is a good way to yeah to tell uh, visually tell a story of of a place and uh, bring your viewer with you kind of to the place. I'm curious, Ivan, how to position yourself, given your background in documentary, how do you position yourself between documentary and journalism? Um, like, for me, like, it, it was a bit by accident that I fell into the whole architecture field. And I, uh, um, but at the same time, like, it, it was for me a completely natural uh, step forward and I didn't change much in the way I was photographing and I feel now also like with the projects I'm doing at the moment uh, these books uh, for instance like the the, uh, uh, the two sides of the border the book with Tatiana like it has very little to do immediately with architecture in a way or like uh, immediate design but uh, much more on sort of the grander uh, ideas of yeah how these different worlds influence like the built environment in many different ways so in a way like i'm uh, photographing the same as what i was doing in terms of documentary photography if you try to tell a story on a place and how people live there and uh, um, uh, photography is always this great excuse to basically come to kind of places where you otherwise don't really belong and uh, yeah, to bring that story out uh, to a different audience. There is a question coming in from Arturo Luhan. How, so how can you tell a story through photography as an outsider visiting, I assume, being new in this context? Mm, yeah, yeah, that's both like I feel always as an outsider and uh, because you're traveling so much and st st constantly have these kind of juxtapositions of place like uh, you step into very different environments and uh, worlds all the time and at I feel like because of that, you're very open also to see the stark differences between these places. And often, like, yeah, um, I see it with myself, like I know Amsterdam um, uh, so well, I grew up here and so on. And uh, it's like you start to overlook a lot of things which you take for granted and um, uh, uh, don't really see anymore. And I think that's also one of the beauties of uh, traveling and constantly seeing new places that you're very open to these uh, stark differences in environment and then uh, it's always also um, yeah collaboration with someone who is from a place and who can sort of open doors and bring you into places but then also like as an outsider you uh, yeah you're often much more receptive to these uh, all these differences and um, it can bring that out I think in a different way. I, I have a question as well. Yeah. Um, in a world where like I, TikTok and Instagram are prioritizing like short videos in that medium over anything and all of their algorithms and like what's being put out to the consumer, how do you see like you being a photographer and like your craft of taking these perfect still shots, like could it ever evolve towards fitting what like all these platforms are kind of like pushing on people to watch with like short videos? Like do you see yourself ever trying to like go into that direction or or try and like fit that trend like you have lots of followers on instagram so like you think that like the still shots 
like are enough or are going to try to like somehow I guess bend to what the platforms are kind of pushing on people or what the people are watching yeah um like I think what 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 the beauty of course of all these platforms is that photography became so accessible and that basically everyone nowadays walks with a camera into their pockets and um, and you can capture sort of everything like right in that moment. Um, and for me, it's also something like I uh, uh, take my Instagram uh, sort of also uh, relatively seriously, um, put a lot uh, out there, but also try to show kind of the, the other uh, side of what uh, what I'm photographing in these places. I feel like my commissioned work or um, like that gets out in the magazines, in the books and so on in these places. But uh, you like uh, Instagram and these platforms are also yeah a very uh, uh, um, easy way to get other material out where you otherwise wouldn't have immediately the uh, the platform or the audience for to publish it so much more kind of a travel story on on these places and how people live uh, in all these different places and okay. yeah I, Ivan, I'm just curious just to follow up on Brian's question I mean do you see your Instagram as a diary of some sort or does the medium affect the way you think or post or present your photographs or the content yeah, like um, for me, it's also a little diary, which I keep sort of up to date of my travels, but also like, yeah, uh, to show the other kind of photographs, which often won't make it out uh, immediately mm. to, to the magazines or to the uh, to books or like immediate uh, ways for which you're there. Um, and yeah, show all this idiosyncrasies of these kind of places and how, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, how, the, how they're all part of this world where we live in. Yet another follow-up on this from Karl Dimitriou Sietelski. Uh, how do you... She's asking, can you share your thoughts about the way architectural photography has evolved? That's why I think this question is relevant to our conversation yeah. about Instagram. Yeah. And where would you like it to go? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, I, I don't come from a background of architectural photography, but, um, of course, like, for a long time, architectural photography was very limited. Um, yeah, because like it needed to uh, show the buildings very straight and like in a sort of perfect composition and, and uh, often cropped to just the buildings, like uh, not showing any of the context or the cities or the places around it. Um, and it was also kind of limited to technology, like. Uh, Architectural photographers were always working with big few cameras, needed a tripod, uh, very carefully composed images and so. And that's that's a trend which uh, has been like kind of disappearing in many uh, different uh, parts of photography. But I feel especially in architecture photography, like it's not necessary to work, to work with these big cameras anymore. Like me, myself, I'm still photographing basically how I was photographing for my documentary work. It's all handheld with small cameras and that allows you to be really up close to people and really sort of direct. And like this sort of miniaturization of technology of cameras. And so uh, for me, like it can't go far enough, basically. Like I, I love shooting basically also with my iPhone and like in the moment that I can do everything with my iPhone and like really uh, remove that barrier of a camera and the things between, uh, yeah, the subject and you and uh, people uh, you're photographing, uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, to make that as transparent as possible and really be kind of fly on the wall and not be so much a photographer who comes in with all their gear and set up and like kind of ruining the moment also. Um, uh, I think that's that's really a great uh, involvement of where photography is going. Can I ask you on your thoughts about the relationship? Since we're talking about future, where this photography is going and Instagram, um, what do you think this relationship is between photography and architecture? Uh, we're noticing currently this trend, especially with interior design, to make the the interior Instagram. We see we see spaces that are 
um, as if they were taken out of Instagram in a way that the medium kind of affects the, the way designers may think. So what do you think this relationship is? What, what should architects um, be careful about even? Mm, yeah, like uh, Instagrammable places, I feel it's also often very flat uh, uh, places. Like everything becomes basically uh, made almost for uh, for 2D for lo for looking on a screen um, so like uh, in like it's it's colorful it's graphic and so on but it it deals very little with the depth and and actually the space uh, anymore and you feel that often like you see uh, of course with many of these uh, like uh, pavilion commissions and so like all these kind of temporary things which uh, many architects do these days that yeah they, they're made for sort of the Instagram like uh, a flashy uh, kind of almost 2D uh, environments and uh, it's also uh, it's it I feel it's a pity because like it it removes a lot uh, of other things where architecture is really uh, uh, made for light space, uh, compression space, and opening up, and all these different feelings it uh, can evoke. So, um, in a way, uh, yeah, like I don't know, like um, I, I try to avoid that that trap also of the sort of uh, the purely Instagrammable picture and. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I try to show kind of also that whole environment and how often also these places are such a juxtaposition with its environment and um, showing kind of the aspects which are yeah also out of uh, reach of the architect or of all the planning things and like that's I feel like where a story starts to happen and where the things yeah happen which you cannot really plan or account for and where like really, really sort of the interesting storyline starts to come out. I, I have a little follow-up I guess to Irene's yeah. question um, you're saying that like Instagram becomes like the other half of your practice it's like you know or it, it's a place where a lot of things you can share that don't are commercially like commissioned or have uh, um, maybe the, the typical professional outlet. Um, have you noticed that there is a, a trend in what filters to one side and what that leaves over for you? Um, just thinking about the, the power, <clears throat> um, the power structures that, that are there to commercially promote a certain type of architectural photography versus the thing that you have your own personal emotional attachment to that doesn't get that kind of spotlight. Yeah, no, like it, it happens like these worlds are of course uh, coming closer to each other also. And it happens also often that uh, uh, editors suddenly see something which you post on Instagram which is not really uh, supposed to be for um, uh, or like it, it wouldn't be otherwise immediately published but like it suddenly piques the interest of an editor and like something else comes out of there often where nowadays like uh, the technology of these uh, of the iPhones is getting so good that like it, it's hard to see the difference anymore of if it's a shot with a real camera or or an iPhone and like it's uh, like these worlds start to blend more and more um, and uh, of course like I'm showing also on Instagram things I really want to show and which maybe I don't have an immediate first use to but like starts maybe another conversation for another project and so so yeah in that way they're they're very connected of course yeah may I take Ekam's uh, question there's a question by Ekam Singh um, in, in two sides of the border and also in some of your aerial shots in the presentation, one can know that urban landscapes occupied by marginalized or impoverished communities are often close to regions vulnerable to climate change and ecological degradation on top of extreme density and lack of green spaces. What are the kind of civic or gathering spaces you have come across in your travels, like the Senegalese exhibition space? Yeah, yeah. 
uh, it's interesting because I feel like there, there, there are many architects and organizations and NGOs in all these parts of the world which are dealing with that uh, question, like how can you make these urban environments uh, in uh, like these uh, impoverished spaces uh, like more uh, healthy and uh, better for uh, for its residents and so. Um, but it's it's a difficult thing. Like I feel like um, if you look at African modernism, that was a very specific moment in time where uh, there was this uh, big yeah uh, government effort to really improve these cities like there was a, a, um, a big optimism in the time of course these countries uh, became independent they wanted to show off to the world they want to make their places better where this big infrastructural um, uh, uh, projects new buildings universities housing projects and so on but lots of the architecture in these kind of places nowadays is on a, in a much smaller scale and architects who yeah are able to do maybe a small park or small community building but the large effect that people had in the 60s and 70s in these places it's very difficult and um uh I can't really say what, uh, why that uh, so much is, but um, luckily there's still architects who are trying to do these kind of things. And uh, but it, it unfortunately it doesn't happen on on a grand scale, which um, is very necessary also in these places. Um, I have a question for you, Alan. Um, so, do you consider the role of um, an architecture photographer as um, subjective role or an objective role because I can see like from this contrast of the intimacy perhaps like in your um, works particularly between the area views of the cities and then also of the cemeteries um, like the people inside so do you think and then there's this correlation perhaps between um, distance and scale with um, the subjectivity and intimacy of a place yeah um yeah f i i feel for me like it's a very subjective view of what i uh, show like it's of course like the subjects i choose are um and people i try to work with uh, are uh, usually close to the interest i i want to show and i want to tell and um uh, you uh, I, I see probably very different things than someone else. So I feel like in the end, it is a very subjective view at the same time. Like I try to show also a lot of these places and not just focus on sort of the perfect uh, design or angle or detail or architecture, but um, show also like yeah, the, how organically uh, these places grow and how all the things kind of outside the reach of of an architect play a role in in a place and in how people live and uh, take over that place. But yeah, I feel like photography, uh, it's of course like it's the moment you choose when do you press the button, uh, what do you select in the end, what uh, what do you want to show in the end, uh, how do you frame it, like uh, you leave out a lot, you include a lot, and these are all sort of yeah personal decisions, but in the end also like a story I feel um, I need to tell on a place and um, yeah, which brings out a place in my sort of view the best yeah. Being mindful of your time everybody this time, is there maybe any final remarks or questions from our panelists or our audience? Uh, I have Thank maybe you. one quick one. Yes, Jack. Um, so it seems to me um, a lot of this uh, beautiful lecture, amazing lecture, um, uh, comes from sort of the level of abstraction that the architect operates on. So for example, with the question of the cemetery turned city, uh, an architect would think of the cemetery as, you know, like the programmatic elements. It would never imagine people moving in and sort of inhabiting that space. So you have this sort of second life or the stories that happen on the outside, like you said, of what the architects sort of think about and so 
I, I'm just uh, curious because I, I haven't really delved into very much photography personally. Um, how you think about the levels of abstraction from a photographer's perspective. So, I mean, it seems to me that when you're walking around a city and you, you capture such a wide view of it, uh, it, it seems like you're capturing all of it, you know, like the ec economics of the place, the, um, the social issues, um, the architecture and how it grows. But I'm wondering um, where you think your abstraction uh, comes in. Yeah, um, it's always, I think like these subjects, they often they slowly develop also, um, like uh, uh, for instance, like with that cemetery, like it was like, I didn't know about that place. And then uh, you talk with a professor there at the university and like uh, he, he's, uh, it's, it's not uh, a big Western university, which can take their students out traveling and everywhere to show, to see all the different examples of architecture. And you see also out of that scarcity comes something else uh, beautiful. And then uh, he brings you to that, uh, that cemetery, which he uses as a, as a subject for his architecture uh, course. And there's suddenly a whole other story developing, and um, it's it's hard to say. Like these things, like evolve over time, uh, all the time, and uh, kind of one thing leads to the other and uh, uh, brings you in kind of totally unexpected places all the time. Have you ever considered making a film, Ivan? I was watching your presentation. We're currently. We were watching La Jete, um, uh, the film from the 60s by Chris Marker and uh, for the residency program. And it's a series of stills uh, progressing. So well, during your lecture, I was looking at those things progressing. I was imagining it as a moving image. Have you considered? Yeah, like um, I, I like to do, I, I like to film also, but it's, uh, it's very, frustrating as a photographer basically to film and to photograph because it's a very different approach and each time like you're filming and you see something like you feel like oh that moment I should have had in a still image or the other way around so in the end I, I kind of gave up a little bit on filming and focused just on on stills um, because your you feel like you're missing out a, all the time. <laughs> your lecture would make a beautiful film Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I do it on Instagram like in Instagram it's of course like the nice thing is that like it's this platform where it's it's completely fluid if you take stills or make movies and and uh, um, that's the nice thing that, it, that you combine it all. But um, yeah, for the rest, I stay to books uh, and stills and so on. Yeah. This is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. I think on that note, we can uh, wrap up this uh, discussion. And uh, very, very many thanks uh, for this uh, beautiful travel in time and space <laughs> and um, thank you to our audience thanks so much for being here for the invitation it was very nice to be thank you so much <laughs> thank you good and good luck Bye with the you. rest of the course there <laughs> i'm curious to see what comes out of it it's always interesting to see it's going to be uh, a moving it, image yeah. <laughs> A moving image, a combination of stills, still images into a moving image. <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, Max, do you want uh, do you want to let yeah. our audience know those who are still here? Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll what the closing. other? Yes, some yeah. closing remarks about T space and other events coming up. Definitely. So, uh, for everyone, the recording of the lecture will be made available at tspace.org/residency. Um, if you'd like to check out more of Yuan's work, we put links in the chat for you. Um, and just to thank all the donors of T-Space, um, Richard Armstrong, Steve Pullamond, Silman, uh, Elise and Jeff, Jeffrey Brown, the Pratt Family Fund, the El Held Foundation, and the Art of Building. Um, if you would like to support T-Space, we put a support link in the chat as well. Um, we'll be back July 13th with a lecture from Yolande Daniels. 
Um, and you can RSVP to that on our website where you can find also more about the lectures and all of our events and things like that. Um, and the T-Space Gallery and the 30 acre natural preserve and sculpture walk in Rhinebeck will be open for visitation in uh, the summer 2022, so next summer. And in the meantime, you can email me at visit at smhfoundation.org, which I'll put in the chat to set up a virtual tour for any time before next summer. Um, on behalf of T-Space, we'd like to thank you and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank